knowledge is very, very expensive for us. Data is expensive, for example. If we do not really make sure that there is part of that knowledge that exists somewhere is accessible to people, we're going to be behind in everywhere. And here comes the disparity that we were talking about. It's the privilege that some people, they cannot see. It's not the, the bling bling that comes with the, the word free knowledge or open knowledge. It's the need that comes from the ground. Hello and welcome to Inspiring Open, candid conversations with influential women who have made an impact in Africa. We're talking about their personal, educational and career journeys, the choices they have made along the way and what they have gained by setting aside their doubts in a world where women's voices and opinions often go unheard and unacknowledged. Inspiring Open is a space to explore the value of sisterhood and how networks of sharing and openness can create waves of change. I am Betty Kankambwedu, a journalist and women's rights advocate. Join me as I explore the fascinating backstories behind Africa's most tenacious female personalities. Inspiring Open is a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women, a project of Wiki in Africa. Be inspired, be challenged, be bold. On Inspiring Open today is Emna Mizuni. After the 2011 Arab Spring in Tunisia, Emna and her team realized that there was little to no information about the rich culture and heritage of their country, and that needed fixing. Emna's love for technology, history, and monuments is what birthed Katagina, an organization that works to document Tunisian history and heritage for future generations, as well as promote that rich Tunisian culture worldwide. She also co-founded Digital Citizenship, an initiative and consultancy for the digital inclusion of women and girls. Emna is an advocate for open culture and open knowledge. She is well known for her contributions to several international entities focusing on human rights and technology. It feels good to have her on the podcast today, so let's get right into it. How is Tunisia, for people who've never been there before, what are, say, the misconceptions that you would like to clear about your country? Oh, there are so many. Um, so whomever is following Tunisia's news online might be uh, depressed from the political and social unrest challenges uh, that the country ha- um, has been going through. But the other reality and the other side of um, of life in Tunisia is really something beautiful. It's challenging as any other African country. And we have that stereotype. We have the sun, we have the beach, we have the mountain, we have everything. But also it's challenging in terms of everyday life. Um, On the side, um, the good things about Tunisia is the warmth of people, the very rich history. Um, There are plenty of things to adore about it. Um, As I said, it's like the nature, uh, the people, the traditions, the places you visit, um, the history you learn about, the different civilizations that cross the country and made Tunisia what it is today. And the the good thing is that it's North Africa. And so we have a little bit of the African culture very embedded within our everyday culture. And that sometimes when I meet my um, fellow um, Africans from other sub-Saharan countries, they are like, oh, you look like us, actually. I was like, yes, <laughs> we're African too. It's like, um, it's very important to emphasize that. Those are the things that we don't talk about. Um, one anecdote on, uh, on Tunisia and how it's seen. Um, lately, I met um, someone whose dream was uh, to visit Tunisia. He studied in his minor um, in university about Tunisia about the history, about visiting and everything. And so I think there are plenty of people like that and I urge them to visit. So um, where did you grow up in Tunisia and what kind of upbringing did you have? So um, I'm from Tunis and I grew up in Tunis, the capital. Um, So I'm a city girl. So I grew up in Tunis. Uh, My childhood was split between the Medina and Bardo 
what I really um, think about it is like how growing up in the Medina old city of Tunis and in Bardo shaped my personality a lot. Um, from all of the traditions that I learned about, all of them, we were talking about the warmth of people, um, the hospitality, um, the humility, um, how friendly they are. No matter from where you come, what's your, your religion or where you come from, what you do in life, that doesn't matter as much as who are you as a person. And so that's, that human side mattered a lot and so yeah I spent most of my life there let's say all of my life there and what kind of values or principles would you say your parents instilled in you that you still carry along till this day oh, in terms of values I think the universal values it's like um humility how you don't lie to people how you respect them how you accept the other um how you, um, like the first principle is not, do not harm anyone, do good um, for yourself, for your um, family, for your community. Um, I've never been restricted like other, um, other of my friends at early age of, from, for example, going out and helping in community work um, because I was a girl, for example. I saw that happening to other of my um, other female friends, and that hurt me a lot. That they were restricted from, for example, doing community work, a cleaning day in the neighborhood, or helping the the people in need. Um, and it's I think this is part of how I grew up. Um, it's not about myself. It's about myself as. Um, as a whole part of a community, but also myself, what I could bring to the community. And that was very important. Um, so yeah, my parents and my siblings helped a lot on this. And the other girls that were restricted, like your friends who were restricted from engaging in communi- communal activities, what in your estimation was that reason? Uh, the main reason was like girls cannot go outside in the streets. Um, or why would you clean the streets? Um, one thing is we have a tradition um, in some neighborhoods in um, in Tunis is that by the end of the day, um, early evening, you have the household or the men of the house um, in a patriarchal society that goes out and cleans in front of his house. And um, it's a very Mediterranean thing where especially in summer nights or spring, they put chairs and tables in front of the houses and sit there. Um, So they do their part in cleaning. But if we talk about cleaning the common space, um, the garden that is in between all of the houses, um, girls are not supposed to do that. And sometimes even boys, depending on the age, but most of the time girls are not allowed to be in the streets they're not allowed to um, talk to um, boys. Um, that changed a little bit, but unfortunately, from my work with adolescent girls, I see it happening again. They're not allowed to do a lot of um, outdoors activities because of the um, because of the gender, basically. Hmm, interesting, because you would think um, it's because of safety reasons. Part of it is safety reasons. Um, you don't know it's like kidnapping could happen all of that if the the girls are not or the let's say children are not um uh controlled and monitored by an elder person um anything could happen like car accidents uh kidnapping and there was a lot of that but also it's it's mainly the gender thing um you cannot do that because you're a girl you cannot do this because you're a girl um, and that continued in different shapes right now. Um, as, I, as I said, from my work with adolescent girls, I see like she cannot have a smartphone because she's a girl. She's not a priority in the house, even if she's the eldest. She's still not a priority. The boy would, who is like, I don't know, one or five years younger, might have a smartphone and she does not. 
I'm happy you had a different experience then. And I guess that is what has shaped you into who you are today. I would want to know what you studied in school. And did you always know that this would be your career path? Did I always know? No, <laughs> honestly. I am the product of a public school in, in, in Tunisia. Um and it's so unfortunate to see that the decline in uh, the quality of education in Tunisia. Um, if it's not private education, there is um, the students are struggling, unfortunately. But I studied, um, if I go slowly from university, I did marketing and communications. I did management and business administration. Um, and before that, I had a um, baccalaureate in sciences. Um, and I studied sciences specifically to become something else. It's funny, I went to sciences to mainly uh, become a pilot. And then uh, that was one of the things that I wanted to do um, as, a, as an adolescent. But then I was like, oh no, what about finishing and then sciences? Um, and then I was a little bit um, rooted. Again, I'm a city girl. So very rooted with my family. I did not want to move uh, to another city to study something else related to sciences. So I moved to management and business administration. <laughs> so that was not my intention at all. And from communications to the civic work, to the change that happened in the country, all of that moved me from basically from the sciences, from um, everything that I had in mind to something pretty new um, that is management. I struggled a lot at the beginning. I was like, why didn't I do economics, for example, uh, as um, my baccalaureate? And then I struggled a little bit in my um, education at the beginning. And then I said, like, I succeeded in many things. Why not? Let's try it. And I did. I succeeded in it. And then I changed into communications um, because I did not like the, not the management life, but I did not like working in a, in a bank. And at that time I had an internship in a bank and that was pretty much a fancy life to have. Um, but I did not like it at all. So I changed into communications and marketing and that changed a lot in my career later on. And so from that to being an activist and working and, um, and making a social change, there is a huge difference. And how are you finding your life? in communications, in social change, in activism. How is that life like for you? I really find myself in here. Like my personality was shaped in a different way. I found that I have a, um, a contribution and I have, um, I have something to leave behind. Um, the change that I see in the society and the small communities that I am part of or the communities I'm trying to um, to influence, the projects that I am leading um, and the impact they leave behind, all of that is very rewarding um, to myself, to the community. And so I feel so happy about this shift in my career. I hardly can see myself as a banker or any of what I was doing. <laughs> no, I see myself a lot with people. And that's part of why I succeeded in communications. Um, and I loved that job for a while. But because we have so much uh, to do in our societies, whether it's Tunisia or elsewhere across Africa, we have a lot of challenges. We have a lot of disparities um, and gaps to fill. There is a lot of things to do that I would keep working in the social aspect as much as I am breathing, I guess. Interesting you talk about gaps to fill, and that will bring me to Carthagena. Yeah, I think it's incredible work you're doing there. What problem did you seek to address when you started Carthagena? You know, uh, Carthagena is the first baby um, to be my own baby. Before that, I was um, part of many. Um, associations and organizations in Tunisia, mainly in the culture or, uh, or humanitarian sectors. Um, but then we go back here to where I grew up. Um, I started spotting the difference in terms of um, not knowledge, but in terms of 
knowing your, uh, your environment and where you come from. When I did a lot of that humanitarian work and cultural events across the country, um, I saw that what I knew as a kid that grew up in the Medina um, in a very Tunisian family um, was not known by other people. And I started digging hard. My very big passion to history from the beginning, from when I was a kid. Um, all of that combined with the crisis that we were living in Tunisia after the revolution. It's like whether we were Arabs or African or uh, Amazigh or I don't know what. It's like different identities, Muslims. Oh, no, we have Christianity before uh, Judaism. All of those religions and identities and civilizations that cross the country and the debate when we were writing the constitution, the 2014 constitution, all of that was an incentive basically to have something that addresses um, the identity crisis that we were living in. Um, and here came the idea of Cartagena. I had it as an idea. I spoke to friends um, who are the co-founders um, and we ended up making it happen. It like, we're good at doing what? We're very passionate about history. We're good at using social media. Everybody's interested in what's happening on social media. We're good at getting and keeping the community together. Um, let's build a community. Let's do something. Let's try to preserve and document our own heritage and history. And that's how it happened. It started in 2013 as a community. Um, and I'm so, so proud of um, the history of Cartagena from 2013 until now. Um, so there are plenty of challenges around Cartagena, but the whole idea is about basically preserving as much as we could what we have. I think you've mentioned that when you started Cartagena, people in government or in authority and, you know, historians didn't take you serious or you and your team serious because they thought you were young. Young people who want to change the world, like face this dismissiveness. What would you tell the older generation about giving young people a chance to make the change they seek to make in this world? It's not easy, but um, with a lot of um, dedication, you can you can make it happen. As I mentioned, um, we were younger when we started Cartagena. In our mid-20s, the eldest of us, or early 30, I think the really eldest one of us, um, who was the Secretary General. But when you put a group of young people there going to ask for um, authorizations, partnerships, to present the whole new idea of merging uh, history, heritage, and technology and social media. Um, there are a lot of like new change and new things to start um, and try that by nature, the human being would resist to that. One would resist out of ignorance or not knowing what we're talking about, two, out of um, ignorance to our age, basically, and our being is like, you're young, you don't know. Uh, we've been around for years. Um, and when we talked with some people who were there doing some work in um, not only public administrations, but also other um, organizations in the country, they were doing the this civil society work under the old regime for 30 years or more. And so for them, they know the administration, which is true. But they don't know what people want right now because there is that gap between them and the people. Uh, they are in the bubble of the administration. Um, but some people, some of them, they really believed in us. Um, when you're dedicated and passionate about something, and that passion could make you win the heart of the receiver or the potential partner. And that's how we um, we won some of these as partners. And they became our um, advocates, actually. They took us to meetings and they were like, these are a group of young people we want to help, we want to work with. 
Uh, these are the future of our organizations, of the civil society work. Let's give them a chance. <laughs> I went through the burden of being young, being a woman, <laughs> and being leader at the same time. But if you don't persist, if you don't have a goal you want to reach, um, I think you would withdraw from the from half of the way. But uh, persistence is the key, and dedication is very, very important. Persistence and dedication is important indeed, because when I look at the work you do, it's you and a group of volunteers who are just passionate about what you're doing. Um, I think you've indicated that when you started this project, you didn't have funding. Um, nobody was getting paid from this project, but you still kept going regardless. And I think there's so much to be said about that, you know, where passion and sheer dedication can take you. Absolutely. I mean, again, I'm so blessed to have had that team and I still have them around me. They are still very dedicated. Um, we we had a, a vision that um, we wanted to invest. We wanted to do that. We wanted to preserve our history um, and work on the heritage uh, and especially the intangible heritage. We wanted um, to follow that thin line, whether we had money or not, whether we had funding or not. Funding was never um, something that we were looking for. Um, and at some point, it was not at all a priority. Everybody put some money from their own pocket. And it, it's funny. I mean, like we pay taxes through our salaries, but also we pay um, our contribution to the community by funding our own events. Um, and we made sure that um, we collaborated with people who believed in the same thing, who had the same values. And we had a lot of contribution in terms of in-kind from the community around us, people who opened their venues for us to host events who gave us internet for free, references and books to uh, to look at, to do our, for example, Medinapedia project. That was a Wikipedia project. What else? People who came just to deliver trainings and uh, not only Wikipedia, but photography and other type of things. Um, from um, online safety to photography, from uh, tour guiding to lecturing, Everybody almost came for free. The only time that we charged people for money was when we rented a bus to go uh, from city to another. But I remember for some additions, for example, for Wikilos monuments, we did we used um, we used our own cars to transport people from one city to the other to take pictures, and that was uh, really something that you do out of love, love to the work that you're doing, out of passion. And everybody was so dedicated to that. And when you're so dedicated, people, they are attracted to you. And that's what attracted the community to us. So for people who were like, mm, we don't even know what they're trying to do when you started Katagina, what kinds of reaction do you get now? Do people see the impact your work is having? This is a very good question. Um, many things change. Uh, people who are interested in joining the team, the core team that is doing the work, people who are becoming, even without uh, approaching them, becoming our ambassadors, speaking about us everywhere. Um, sometimes I would be working and I receive a text or video or a picture from an event that is happening somewhere else I have no idea about. And where somebody mentions Cartagena, I was like, this is an initiative to follow. People who are basically taking in the brand of Cartagena and putting it like as a recommendation to donors, um, donors who are following us wherever we go and like, why don't you apply for this? We want to give you money. <laughs> and it's it's really, really rewarding in many ways to see the growth in terms of um, community the kids that started going out with us in our tours and trips that are now adolescents. This is amazing to see. They never missed um, an activity. 
or even when they miss an activity, they come and ask about what happened, the human connections, whether it's a love story or a professional connection through Cartagena. So the network became big. It's flourishing in a very good way. And yeah, I mean, we're, we're considered leaders in what we're doing. We're not part of the governmental organizations or the organizations that are um, receiving funds from um, the government. But we are a key part in everything. Every time, for example, the municipality of Tunis, when they ha- do an event, they host an event or a um, conference, training, Cartagena has to be there. Whether we know about it or not, they will send us the information. It's like, you're a key player. We want you to be part of us, part of the conversation. Interesting. And I'm glad you've come this far. And I just believe that you're even going to go farther. Let me move on to open and open knowledge. Why is open knowledge so important to you? And I think it reflects in the work you do, pretty much who you are. It's very important. I mean, in in different ways, it's very important. But if we um, put it in a way, coming from... um, developing countries or coming from the global south we know the importance of things we don't have the privilege that others have we don't have the privilege of having access to a good education access to knowledge Um, for example in tunisia we cannot some people cannot afford um, buying books Um, unfortunately to buy a book that is a um, for example, a Tunisian book or an Arab um, Arabic literature book, it costs way more than your budget, your weekly budget sometimes. As a grown-up um, professional, I'm not talking about even um, young people. Um, it's so expensive. I don't know, I was reading this yesterday from an editor. If you put um, the average in the word, a book would cost the same as a coffee that you grab from a coffee shop in um, the Western world. Knowledge is very, very expensive for us. Data is expensive, for example. Um, And so um, if we do not really make make sure that there is part of that knowledge that exists somewhere, is accessible to people, we're going to be behind in everywhere. Um, And here comes the disparity that we were talking about. It's the privilege that some people, they cannot see if they're like, it's not the the bling bling that comes with the the word uh, free knowledge or open knowledge. It's the need that comes from the ground. If I am an advocate for open knowledge, I know the importance that could make the open knowledge in the lives of other, other people who are, who do not have the same privilege. If we take some countries like in the US, for example, when you walk around and you find free libraries, like the small small books outside um, of their houses, they put books for free. You take, you exchange, um, books are affordable. Uh, if you buy a coffee for $5, uh, you can buy a book for $5. Everything around this is important. It's like, that's knowledge that's available. We don't have that same culture. How can we make it available? If we write about certain topics, um, if we pay tribute to certain people, leaders, um, it's very important. Um, Unfortunately, um, internet was and has been for so long so wide that the knowledge coming from our area of the world does not exist or is challenged. So open knowledge is equal negotiating for um, making your knowledge exist, um, making sure that the richness of our knowledge that is mainly oral knowledge is there, documented for future generations is important. Um, That's really my motive for being an advocate and for working harder in this. When I look at your life, It appears you've been an activist all along. And I guess at every point in your life, you are pulled to a particular direction, but it's still activism. How did you get into activism? As you said, it's like I've been my whole life an activist without even knowing it. 
Um, but if you have um, values and you have a certain way of seeing things and you just cannot stand things going in the wrong place or being deprived from things or seeing injustice, um, I think you would be drawn to fight against that injustice. I mean, we're equal humans. You should not treat women uh, as a secondary type of human um, or not citizens enough um, and all of that. And to a certain extent, I think being Tunisian helped a lot. Um, for example, in terms of women's rights, um, women's rights movement in Tunisia was so advanced comparing to other countries within the region. We did not have the same issues. We were ahead in certain things. But again, as I told you, in terms of culture, we have very conservative um, areas around the country where um, I cannot be myself uh, and I cannot be heard because I am a woman. And that's even within my family. As an anecdote, uh, my grandfather, which I loved and cherished so much, for him, it was like certain things I cannot do because I was a woman, but I was able to convince him otherwise um, and able to convince him that, no, even if I am a woman, I can do this, I can do that, and I can prove myself. And he became very proud of me um, because of that. Um, so I, if I won my very um, nomad, Bedouin, uh, patriarchal grandfather, I think that was a big move. Um, um, but it's like our own existence as women um, in, in Africa or the Arab world is a way of resistance. You resist everything every day. Um, you challenge, you're challenged every day. You're challenged to prove your existence in, uh, in schools. You're challenged to prove your existence in the, within the family itself, uh, within the community. You challenge your existence to make your way through uh, your professional career. Um, and all of the challenges that come around, um, women, they do not help most of the time because they're in that societal bubble that they are not supposed to do this. And so how can you really do everything you want if you are not resisting and being an activist in your own life? Um, you either go within the bubble and accept your role uh, in a patriarchal society or you just decide to go against it. And that's activism. And so if I am an activist for myself and for others, and uh, speaking on behalf of others, I think there are other women who are activists in their own lives only. Um, that's maybe the difference between me and some people, but our own existence as women is a challenge in itself. And so all of those stereotypes and all of those practices within the society, you have to resist them. And so by default, being a woman makes you an activist um, in different ways. Indeed it does. So sometimes it can be a bit disheartening when other women see activists, particularly those pushing for women empowerment in a negative light. Sometimes they are tagged as men haters and all sorts of names. And in certain places, when you say you're even a feminist, you're looked at in a very different way. But I agree with you, like you said, being a woman, it should make you an automatic activist, given the, the prevailing circumstances around us. So you do a lot of your activism online. You are very present in the digital space. And I reckon it's not such an easy space for women. How easy has it been navigating these spaces as a woman? That's a very good question for two reasons. The first reason is that I am present online as much as I'm present on the ground. And that's what people, they don't see sometimes um, when they are behind their screens, they think that I am a, an online activist. I do online and the ground. Um, I participate in both and I do a lot of work in the ground actually more than the online uh, presence. But in terms of actually the digital presence and online activism, I think being a woman <laughs> online, speaking your mind, 
makes it very hard for you. And if you're not strong enough uh, and dedicated enough and you allow yourself some time off, you can be easily, easily harmed. Why I say that, it's not, it's not to threaten anyone or uh, make anyone be scared, but we've seen a rise of hate speech and um, smearing campaigns against women online. That is incredible. And being part of a society that is very conservative could lead to major, um, major harm against women activists online. Within digital citizenship, we tried to um, to address that point, uh, but we did several campaigns like "Stop Silencing Women Online" or "You're Not Alone," just to show women that actually they are not alone. Um, if I speak up and I campaign online, you have to be sure that I am receiving um, tens of messages and um, either direct messages or hacking attempts or all of that type of the digital violence or the online violence that you can imagine. So, so for example, if I, I am speaking on, on a very specific topic, I would receive death threats. I would receive insults, all type of things. And at some point that goes from just, for example, receiving those messages on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram to actually receiving them on my regular phone. And I think I'm, um, I'm privileged enough to not have it cascade into real life, but we saw in real life lots of activists and especially through our work um, and that you're not alone campaign. A lot of activists, their activism, online presence and speaking out their minds led to people attacking them in the streets, um, being violent against them. They were beating in the streets. The very beginning, actually, and this is how basically we created digital citizenship as an initiative. Um, I thought I was alone being targeted for what I spoke about when I received all of those messages, like really dirty messages that he would say like, why, what did I do wrong? And they were not coming from my own country only. They were coming from different places, like insulting me as a woman, uh, threatening me with my family or sending me porn pictures, sending me porn invitations. And I would say, like, why would I do that? Why am I subject to that? And then what happened is um, I met other activists, women from other countries, and they were subject to the same, actually. And so it's a matter, it does not really, I'm not alone in this, actually. Women, they are targeted. Um, and when we do a research on women's existence online, um, it shows a lot. And we did it... Um, in the Arab world, basically, it shows that women, to avoid that type of violence, of hate speech online, um, they tend not to have their own names, real names, on their, for example, Facebook accounts or Twitter or Instagram. They tend not to use their pictures. Wow. If it's a mother, she she says like, Um Fulen, the mother of X. Um, and she puts the picture of a heart or a picture of nature or a picture of her son. Um, so it's like basically she hides behind a virtual identity just to be there in the social media network. Um, and those are not women activists, but generally speaking, women online. And so we have to call on these things, actually, and say, no, this is not right. You should stop it. That's part of the activism that I talk about. <laughs> yeah. And as, as you mentioned, women, we need to stick together. And I'm glad that you found a community to know that you are not alone. I'm happy you're still standing. You haven't quit. I wanted to move to digital citizenship, but you've touched on that. So I'll continue from there. What would you say or in what ways have women and girls' lives improved 
um, since coming into contact with digital citizenships? Um, I would say this is a big thing to say that women's lives improved, but at least we know that um, we created the first seed um, as an initiative for getting women together um, and emphasizing from the early age because the first target that we work with is the adolescent girls, that the concept of sisterhood, as you mentioned. That's a very important thing. And that um, we've been trying to get them to a better online safe space. At least if the space, the general environment is not safe and is very toxic with the hate speech and violence, at least they know how to report that, at least they know how to keep themselves safe from hacking attempts. And we saw actually why we invested in that a lot, because we saw cases of girls who were um, pushed to stay at home and leave school based on leaking conversations and leaking pictures um, from hacked accounts on social media. It's like, how can we stop that? How can we stop the bullying against them? and explaining to them basically the meaning of each one of them. We touched different people, different ages. It was very important to build the sisterhood at an early age, which is an ongoing program for us, but also to build it um, as a network of established women, not only young girls. Um, And so working with young girls is so, so rewarding actually. And it's very good to see, um, very fulfilling, actually, to see how girls, they, they're they eager to know. They're very smart. Um, and if you give them the right tools uh, that they need and you listen to what they need from them, not assume things um, that could help getting their life better. So there are plenty of things that we're trying. And uh, basically, we're responding to their needs as they voice them, but we're emphasizing mainly the sisterhood, because if you don't have a community, you can you will be left alone. Yeah. You cannot move forward. What is that one challenge you faced consistently? And how have you managed to deal with that? Proving myself, proving that I am worth being there, I'm worth being at the table talking. Um It took me a long, long way to prove myself. Proving myself was a very painful process. Proving myself as a leader in my own community. One time uh, someone said to me from from the Cartagena community that when they knew my age, they were surprised. They thought I was a woman in my late 30s because of the way I behaved. I had to behave in a certain way, a very serious way to make sure that I'm respected and my leadership is respected, that I had to be in a certain headspace and a certain way of behaving. And you've managed to navigate it so well that you're still here to, <laughs> you don't agree? <laughs> it's not that I don't agree, but it's a, it's a big challenge. It's still ongoing. It's I still have to prove myself in different ways, yes. um, in different places, even to people who are part of the community. Sometimes people who do not, who see me as a, as a threat while they see me as, I'd rather be one of those invisible leaders who pushes from behind um, and wants everyone within the team to be a leader in itself. Um, some people they see me as a threat is like oh she's way too much how can we take that from her they don't see the hard work yeah like, for example I would give a random example why is she with comedian of the year what did she do they don't see the hard work behind it they don't yeah. see the endless long nights that I spent instead of sleeping I would be working on certain things, doing certain things, empowering communities and preparing for conferences, taking from my own leave to attend the conference or to organize a conference and using my own capacities and expertise and networks for that to happen. All of that is not seen. And it's a continuous challenge, basically. 
and it's I think, not done yet. <laughs> yeah, and I think this is what has fostered this um, imposter syndrome. Women uh, occupying certain positions and then they doubt themselves if they even deserve to be there. And sometimes it's because of comments, like you just mentioned, from people who don't see the hard work that you put in, but all they see is that you are in this position and then they project these comments on you and then you start believing okay maybe I don't deserve to be here maybe I can't take up this space and do the best I can do here that's very true and what you mentioned it, I mean if Michelle Obama suffered from imposter syndrome <laughs> you can imagine the case of other women and uh, yeah definitely what saddens me is that I know I would expect it to come from men for example but what saddens me when it comes from women but I, I've been so blessed to have a lot of women around me in my network that would be my supporting system to push me to like, no, you're worth it. You can do that. You deserve to be there. Women mentors, women friends, all of these women in my life, they really are the, the type of the supporting system that I have. In addition to my own family, they really helped me in my career. They helped by suggesting to me to do certain things, certain ways, um, and saying like, you know, you're not alone, or you deserve this because X and Y. Um, and if you achieved enough, if this is where you want, what's your new goal in life? All of these is like, I think it's really important for us to be in, in a space where we're supported. Again, sisterhood, family, um, that type of support is very important to keep going and to overcome any type of doubt or imposter syndrome or anything. And I don't know why people think that <laughs> women activists like can't have love or can't have men in their lives. Is it something you've experienced? Yes. <laughs> yes, I did experience that a lot. Uh, and yes, I have a man in my life and I'm married and so in love with my man. Yeah, some men, they came to me and was like, oh, you're too strong for a man to handle. You cannot find anyone. Or, oh, I pity you. You're like any other woman activist that does not have anyone in her life. And like, I keep quiet. I never said anything about it. And I think many women in throughout history, they... They were subject to that. It's not it's not as activists, but women leaders in general. Um, it's like if she is a leader, her husband or her partner is not is not as man as he's supposed to be. Yeah, he's weak. Um, he's weak. Exactly. But no, my husband is a very strong man. He's um, he's very good at what he does. He's a leader himself because he's very supportive. He understands he's a feminist in his own way, mm. um, supporting very, very much what I do, uh, despite being from different cultures or different, uh, speaking different languages um, as the native or mother tongue. Despite all of that, he's a supportive person. So yeah, women activists, they could have men in their life. They could have love relationships, whether it's a man or woman. And I think it's the same for some men activists, not all of them, but some of them. I know some of them who are struggling to find the right woman next to them. So it's a matter, I think, of a love relationship. It's not only activism. Yeah, I agree. And for people who think that men who are by the side of strong women uh, must be weak, I, I just, I, like, I can't even imagine because... It will take a man who is equally strong and who is equally a man in his own right to be able to match a woman who is also strong and a woman in her own right. Like those energies need to match. So it's it's just incredible that people have this thought process concerning women leaders, activists, and, and all that. Anyway, what kind of Tunisia would you want your child to inherit? Uh, I would love to have a um, more resilient, more stable Tunisia. The education system will get better. I hope for my children that things will be better, less of um, um, digital threats, 
less of um, stereotypes against women um, and also against men. Men should not do that, should not do that. All of this, I, I hope that they get a better future. Um, and I hope they love my country as much as I do love it. Thank you so much, Emna. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. I've really enjoyed the conversation. I hope you've also enjoyed it. I did. It was so, so good to reflect on certain things. Thank you so much for having me. Emna Mizuni is founder of Carthagena and Digital Citizenship. We do wish her the very best in her advocacy for her country, especially for women and girls. Thank you for listening to Inspiring Open, a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women. This first series of Inspiring Open was funded through the International Relief Fund for Organizations in Culture and Education 2021, an initiative of the German Federal Foreign Office, the Gothi Institute and other partners, and an annual grant from the Wikimedia Foundation. If you enjoyed today's show, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Feel free to share, rate, and review us. We appreciate the support. You can also tag us in your posts. We are at Wiki Loves Women on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'll leave you with the words of Ntozake Shange. Sisterhood is important because we are all we have to stand on. We have to stand near and by each other, pray for one another, and share the joys and the difficulties that women face in the world today. If we don't talk about it amongst ourselves, then we are made silent by the patriarchy, and that serves us no purpose. Until next time, look after yourselves and your sisters. And remember, be inspired, be challenged, be bold. I am Betty Kankambwedu, and you've been listening to Wiki Loves Women, Inspiring Open.